I want to just jump in and get started with the town hall. Uh, this is being brought to you by the League of Independent Theater and Indie Space. They are sister organizations. I'm Amy Todoroff. I'm the acting director of the League of Independent Theater, and I took over a about this time last summer as the acting director. My goal at the time was I wanted to create more volunteer opportunities and do some voting drives and voter initiatives. And in the last year we have done that, but I never expected that I would be hosting a Zoom for 500 people asking the city to completely re-examine the real estate market. But yet here we are, this is, <clears throat> just necessary. This is something that we we really have to address for the survival of our arts and our small businesses and our communities. Uh, we are thrilled so many of you are joining in. We're going to be close to 400 strong in attendance today, perhaps more. Uh, the agenda, I'm going to run through that for you quickly today. We'll start with an introduction to our panelists, then we'll hear from some venue owners and move into a panel discussion. After the panel discussion with our panelists, there will be a Q&A. During the panel discussion, all of those in attendance can ask questions through the chat window that's located at the bottom of your screen. I know we're all getting used to Zoom technology. Uh, and Lit's Katie Palmer will be monitoring those questions during the Q&A. Uh, she will then share some of those questions. Uh, we'll try to get a good representative sample of those, but uh, due to time constraints, we might not get to every question. She will also answer questions live if it's something that we can answer off the top of our heads, like this is the name of the legislation for you to look up, things like that. After those questions are read, we will take live questions from the attendees. To ask the panelists a live question, you must raise your hand it's the blue hand feature at the bottom of your participants panel. That will let us call on people in the order that you raise your hand. And if you're not sure where that is, you click on participants at the bottom of your screen, a panel will pop up and there'll be a little blue hand. It says raise hand. And that's how you are able to get to that function. And we'll know that you have a question. We're so grateful that these panelists took their time to be with us today. Uh, we ask that the questions remain respectful and are kept brief for the consideration of others who have questions to ask. Uh, let's, let's meet our panelists, shall we? Uh, as I introduce each of you, I'm just I'm really interested in getting to know a little bit about you. So uh, I will introduce you and if you could just tell us something that you're excited about or looking forward to in the next few days. Right, first, uh, we have New York State Senator Brad Hoyleman, who represents the 27th Brad district. Is he here? Hmm. I don't see oh, no, him. he is not. He is coming in a little bit late. He did get called into session. So, ah, yes, let's move into Assembly Member Harvey Epstein from District 74. He his district covers the Lower East Side and East Village. He is an advocate for the progressive movement, supporting environmental sustainability, public education, voting and criminal justice reform, and legislation like the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019. Assembly member, would you like to say hello? Hello, everyone. How are you? Thanks for including me here. Great. Uh, we also have assembly member Robert Carroll. He is the chair of the subcommittee on museums and cultural institutions. He was born and raised in his Brooklyn assembly district 44 covering Windsor Terrace in Kensington and was a practicing attorney prior to being elected. Uh, I'm also gonna out him as a really fine playwright whose play The Believers I just happened to see at an indie venue right down the street from my house. I'm really excited to have you here assembly member. Would you like to say hello? Well, hello. Well, yes, that was a good plan. I'm glad you saw it and liked it. Um, maybe there'll be another one one day. Um, That's great. I'm excited to be here, uh, and your organization is, helps make New York what it is, and I'm excited about figuring out ways in these next coming weeks about making sure that we have independent theaters uh, survive in New York City, because you guys really are um, some of the lifeblood that makes New York what New York is. Thank you so much. Uh, you've always been an advocate and we appreciate you. Uh, 
Now I'm gonna say this next line and you're gonna know exactly who I'm talking about. He is a lifelong resident of Queens, is Jimmy Van Bramer, has served on the New York City Council since 2010, representing the people of Queens 26th Council District. He is now serving as deputy leader of the City Council, chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, and is a member of the speaker's budget negotiating team. Uh, Jimmy, say hello. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. and. Um, uh, I'm uh, sad that I can't be on um, for the entire call because at 1.30 we are actually having a stated meeting of the New York City Council. Um, uh, so uh, I will need to uh, uh, be present and vote uh, on some important pieces of legislation today. But uh, obviously I'm a big supporter of the arts, big supporter of uh, independent theater and uh, want to see uh, everyone be able to survive this moment. You asked if there's something that we're excited about or um, looking forward to, and uh, that's a really hard question to answer right now in life generally, but uh, one thing that we can all be hopeful for is that uh, 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 independent theaters are gonna survive uh, and that we're gonna do everything we can uh, to allow them to survive. So that's something to be hopeful for um, I don't get excited about too much right now. Well, council member, we are going to keep an eye on the clock uh, and maybe jump ahead to ask you a few questions if necessary. But sure. uh, great. Uh, next up, we have Delcenia Glover, the deputy public advocate for housing equity, where she brings her long years of experience as a leader in the movement for the preservation of affordable housing in communities in New York City. Prior to joining the Office of Public Advocate Jumane D. Williams, she was Executive Director of Tenants and Neighbors, and as such a leader for the Housing Justice for All campaign, whose dedication and activism resulted in the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019. So we've got some friends on the panel here. Yes, I do. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I know you wanted Jumane here, but I'm here instead. <laughs> Thrilled to have you. But, uh, and uh, Jimmy, hey Jimmy, hey Harvey. Uh, yes, I do have some friends here. Really happy to be here. Um, and so your question was, what am, uh, what are we, what are you excited about? Is it happening in the next couple of days? This evening, actually, we are doing a housing equity legal clinic uh, for tenants across the city, citywide. And uh, so far, we have 125 folks participating, and we will be talking to tenants in individual rooms who are rent regulated, HUD, NYCHA, and Mitchell Lama. So that's what I'm excited about this evening at uh, 6 o'clock. And you feel free to join us. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, maybe if you could put that information in the chat, then Katie sure can will. share it with everyone. Thank you. Uh, we also have Justin Cantor who is the co-founder of the cherished Greenwich Village music venue, La Poisson Rouge. So I know you all have been there, spent many a good time there. And vice president of the National Independent Venue Association, a united group of over 1,600 independent venues currently fighting for collective survival on Capitol Hill. This is a fantastic organization that pulled together in just the last few months, and we're thrilled to have Justin a part of the panel. Justin? Hello, nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, it's been, it was great. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke with Randy Berry and learned all about Indie Spaces and um, the advocacy you all are doing uh, with regards to rent. And it's something that obviously um, independent music venues um, are facing exactly the same thing. So to have the solidarity and um, come together on, on this issue, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And participate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that leads us into a woman who needs no introduction. I know you all know Randy Berry. She is the co-founder of both Indie Space and the Indie Theater Fund. Randy. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, executive director of Indie Space and the Indie Theater Fund, two organizations that support indie theater makers in the city. I'll get into what Indie Space does a little bit later so that we can move on, but something I'm excited about is the weekend. I'm excited for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm excited about. Fantastic. So uh, I know, oh, oh, I almost forgot the most important person here, Guy Yedwab, who is the president of the League of Independent Theater. 
Hello, Guy. We're that such is, close friends. I just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is slightly overstating my importance in this uh, illustrious room. Uh, my name is Guy Edwab. I was the previous managing director, and now I'm uh, on the board of the League of Independent Theater. Uh, and I can't think of anything I'm more excited than this conversation. Yay! Yeah, good call, Guy. All right, now, I, I know we all want to just dive right into this panel discussion. Uh, but before we get, begin, I, I think it's, it's important to take a moment to really think about and set our minds and hearts on why we're really here. And that's the venues and the artists that are in such dire circumstances right now due to this COVID-19 crisis. And so to that end, I've invited a handful of venue owners to just give a very brief testimonial about the importance of their space, the communities they serve, and the issues that they're facing. So first up, I'm going to bring in, uh, let's see, we have Lost Terry, which means, uh, Anamari, I'm going to bring you in next for you to speak, and hopefully we'll get Terry back in a moment. Uh, Anamari. Hello, I'm here. There she is. <laughs> Speak whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anamari Dekasada. I'm the producing artistic director of the Wild Project. We're an 89 seat venue located. We serve the East Village and the Lower East Side. We opened um, just a really quick brief history. We opened in July of 2007. Um, sustainable architecture project that we have. We have a green roof, rooftop garden, and solar panels, so we're very proud to be eco-friendly eco space. Um, we're also home to many resident theater companies. Um, for over six plus years, we've been home to Club Thumb Summerworks, um, Poetic Theater Productions, Poetic License Festival, as well as All Out Arts, um, the LGBTQ Fresh Fruit Festival. And many others, cherry picking, playwright festival. And um, so we serve thousands of artists every year. And also in between these resident artists, we produce our own stuff and we're, we're a platform for individual artists. We like to give subsidized space and free space to people to be able to present new work. Um, and this, we've been, thank you first of all for the of Independent Theater in Indie Space. Um, Randy has been great. She's been helping us. We've been um, tackling rent increases the past couple years. And for this to happen to us at this time is um, detrimental to, to our future. And without canceled rent or some sort of forgiveness this year, I'm afraid that the whole downtown theater community, not just us, um, our future is at risk. And our relationship within the community is at risk. And I want to say one more thing, um, not only the artistic relationship we have with all the artists in our community, but also the residents and the local businesses and how we contribute to the economy of the East Village and Lower East Side. We have great um, relationships with the restaurants and the retail stores in our area, as well as the residents and the community gardens. And um, we're there for each other. <laughs> In just the everyday things when people need to borrow things from us, as simple as like a hand truck to help deliver things and um, a resident needs to, they want to help support a local charity and they ask me a free night to do this fundraiser. I said, absolutely. So not only are we home for artists, but it's also the people within who live in our community and we've established roots with. And that relationship is just as important as our artistic one that we have. And I just think that the economic and the social impact we have in our community as venues is, is just as important. Thank you so much, Anamari. Uh, I found Terry, so I'm going to bring Terry back in now as uh, someone that can give a testimonial. Okay, so Terry should be joining us in just a moment. Terry? Hmm. There he is. I am. Okay, now I'm unmuted and I'm visible. Hi. Yes. I didn't know I was lost. 
So. <laughs> I lost you for a moment, but I found you. You are the founder, executive director, and actor at the Irondale Ensemble Project. Correct, yes. And I want to thank you, Amy and Randy, for organizing this, and thank you for inviting me to talk today. We are going through some crazy days. I think there'll be a lot of great art that is based on our experience in these particular times. And, uh, we're learning a lot as we shelter in place. We're learning not only to use platforms like this to stay in touch, but we're learning to use them to create art. It's something I never thought I would embrace because for me, theater is about the gathering. It's gathering people together in a single room to tell and hear stories that bring about the possibility of creating a world that's changed for the better. Uh, has, lock been, has being locked out of my theater stopped me from making art? No, I'm still teaching and performing through Zoom, still attempting to create community and through this strange uh, medium. But of course, there's a huge difference and that's why we're here today. The spaces for gathering will open again, but we must be able to maintain and afford them. In the 11 years that, since Irondale turned the former Sunday school at the Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian Church into the Irondale Center, it has become a destination point for cutting edge theater and quality education and community engagement programs. It has become a center for people to come together, a place to catalyze democratic activity through theater. And most of all, it has brought stability and a level of equity to a rapidly changing neighborhood as it changed, gentrified and redefined itself. So now is the time we need our communities to stand by us we may need to lean a little on them as they've been able to lean on us. Rent abatement, reduction and assistance will help us face the unknown that we are about to enter and to know we are not in it alone. Thank you, Terry. Very, very powerful words. Uh, I'm going to ask the rest of the people that I've asked to give some testimonials to switch up the schedule just a little bit because we are going to lose uh, Councilman Van Bramer. So I'd like to uh, throw this over to Guy for a moment. We will ask some specific questions to Councilman Van Bramer and then we will go back into the testimonials. Uh, I appreciate your patience. Uh, I know that you've really thought out what you want to say to the group, but we also want to make sure that we don't lose Councilman Van Bramer. Okay, uh, Guy? Great, thank you, Amy. Um, and thank you, council member. I know that uh, there's a lot going on right now and we appreciate your time and also all of your past support. Um, we were actually listening to a discussion of the rent crisis this morning on Brian Lehrer and they were talking about how somewhere between a third uh, to uh, by another number 45% of people are already not paying rent uh, over the last couple months. Um, our community is going to be one of the last communities to be able to return to making profit, opening, you know, opening our doors. Um, so we just wanted to get your perspective on rent cancellation, you know, other rent protections. Uh, what, what are you looking at at the city level? You're on mute. Oh, hang on, I can unmute you. Mm -hmm. I think okay. I unmuted myself. You did it. There you go. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, so let me just say, I understand that the current situation represents uh, an existential uh, crisis for uh, all uh, of you. Uh, and um, uh, survival is essential here. Uh, and, and without uh, complete uh, cancellation of rent and rent forgiveness uh, uh, for the duration of this crisis, uh, uh, so many um, small and independent theaters would simply fail uh, and, and cease to exist. We cannot allow all of you uh, to be removed from the cultural landscape of the city of New York. Um, there is no city of New York without artists, uh, and there is no uh, theater uh, community without uh, uh, small independent theaters. So, um, so I certainly support uh, 
uh, the, the the cancellation of rent. And I love your 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 uh, background guy. Is that a permanent situation, or is that like a? Uh, this is the Zoom background. Uh, the League of Independent Theater is part of the coalition uh, United for Small Businesses that's leading the cancel rent. So they yeah. threw it together so we could all get the word out. Right. Um, so yeah, no, I'm there, and and look, we certainly support the the legislation going on in Albany, uh, uh, as you know. Uh, uh, Senator Gineris has uh, some good legislation. Obviously, you've got two of the most progressive assembly members uh, on this panel uh, right now. And as the chair of cultural affairs for the city of New York, who sits on the budget negotiating team, um, staring at a $10 billion deficit right now, um, you know, I am I am going to uh, be devoting the next month of my life to, to making sure uh, that our community is is respected in this process and not devastated. Um, but it goes beyond simply funding and allocation of funding um, because for so many of you, um, uh, uh, you simply can't be uh, right now, right? You can't exist as you normally exist right now. And as you mentioned, you know, theaters, whenever we come back, whatever phase you're in, right? Um, how theater reopens, right? Can you even fill the house, right? Are you limited to 25% capacity, 50% capacity? And how do you even survive um, with that limited capacity? So, um, so we have to rethink the whole paradigm within which you exist. And part of that, obviously, in this moment of crisis, uh, involves rent forgiveness um, while we are going through this and your doors are closed and you are unable to generate any kind of revenue whatsoever. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, we very much appreciate the support because I, I agree that that's definitely the reality that we're looking at. I know that City Council in the last few days passed um, some actions to protect uh, commercial tenants from harassment. Um, can you comment on that and on any other proposals that City Council is looking at to help uh, commercial tenants in this uh, crisis? Well, I, look, I think the council is doing some some great work. We passed a, a package of legislation uh, meant to help uh, uh, commercial uh, tenants survive. And obviously, um, we are uh, uh, hoping that the state legislation uh, will will pass and get through. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure that your, your state legislators can talk a little bit more about the situation in Albany, um, but hopefully uh, Senator Gene Harris, who is my senator, um, that legislation passes and uh, the governor um, sees fit to uh, uh, approve it. Um, but, uh, you know, we are uh, laser focused on and making sure that small businesses survive. And I include you all in that um, uh, vein because uh, small independent uh, uh, nonprofit theaters are also small businesses. Um, so we have more legislation coming. Um, you know, I also think that as we uh, introduce legislation today in about three minutes, um, when uh, the stated meeting of the city of New York uh, starts, um, we're talking about opening streets to restaurants and um, uh, plazas. We should be thinking about extending that to uh, uh, cultural performances, right? And maybe uh, allowing uh, independent theaters uh, to have a production uh, on a plaza outside, um, social distancing and mass uh, appropriate but the legislation that we're passing today is about, uh, what we're introducing today is about restaurants and making sure that they have the sidewalk, street and plaza space to operate safely, but that should be expanded. Uh, and I am working to make sure that's expanded to include uh, taking the arts and theater, uh, in particular, small local nonprofit independent community-based theater into the streets so that people can actually be sitting there and having a beer um, and uh, maybe a cocktail, but then also safely enjoying a performance. Um, I think that's part of our, uh, 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 you know, 
re-envisioning how we do the work that we do and how you all are gonna survive this moment. Um, because going inside for a while is gonna be challenging to a lot of people. And even when you do go inside, that's gonna look a lot different than it, current, than it did before COVID. So getting us outside um, and making it easier to go outside um, is incredibly important. Um, and I also just wanna shout out, cause I know that there's some Queens folks. I love small independent theater everywhere, um, but I know that uh, Cambry and some folks from QED and Sheila Lewandowski from the Chocolate Factory and um, some of the others who I who I have seen in the um, in the chat, uh, I just want to shout them out because they do great work, and I know how important it is. And and I just want you know from the bottom of my heart, I know how terrifying this moment is, and what an existentially threatening moment this is to your livelihoods and to artists in general. So uh, maybe that was too long, guy, but that was uh, uh, the answer to that question. No, I think that was uh, that was very helpful to understand. I think the any creative solution to being able to hold events, bring people together, and and um, bring things together, I think is is going to be helpful for our community. Uh, I know that we are running up right against your time, so. Well, I, I'm actually I have staff on this call, and I have staff <laughs> monitoring the stated meeting, and they're telling me that I'm not needed yet. Uh, on the stated meeting. So uh, even when I leave, Jack Bernadovitz, who's my cultural uh, uh, liaison, is um, uh, going to remain on the call, but I can remain on until uh, my chief of staff texts me and tells me that I have to uh, join the stated meeting. I also, I think Talia Spanish Theater uh, is on the call as well, and we are huge supporters of Talia, uh, uh, which is one of the most amazing uh, theaters in the world, if not in Sunnyside, Queens. Great. Well, since we have a little bit uh, more time, um, one of the questions that's been asked uh, from the audience was about, uh, even before this crisis, I think the rise in uh, commercial rents was uh, a problem for the nonprofit community. Uh, and there was conversations about rent stabilization and other ways of, of pushing back against that. Can you comment Obviously, we have this short-term crisis that we want to survive now, but the longer-term uh, pressures uh, continue to exist as well. Yeah, so I, I mean, uh, I, I've been a supporter of, uh, of uh, a couple of different bills. Obviously, there was the Small Business Job Survival Act, but, but then Councilmember Levin uh, from Brooklyn uh, introduced uh, uh, what I think is an even more aggressive um, uh, uh, small business uh, uh, rent control uh, law that I'm a co-prime sponsor of. And um, we have got to do more uh, to level the playing field and give more power uh, to you all in particular, but to all commercial uh, tenants uh, who uh, the, the deck is stacked against you when it come comes time to uh, the length of a lease or renegotiating a lease, the amount of money that can be uh, jacked up uh, once you've made a space desirable and then the landlord uh, decides, um, you know, uh, what was once uh, an abandoned uh, spot is now turned pretty trendy because you opened, uh, uh, we'll say the chocolate factory or QED and then a, a cute cafe opened up next door and then a uh, a nice trendy restaurant opened up across the street and all of a sudden, bang, we've got something really good here. Uh, but then when your lease is up, um, uh, they're, they're told your rent is going up, you know, 50%, 75%, 100%. So uh, uh, I'm a supporter of both of those uh, pieces of legislation, a prime sponsor of both those pieces of legislation. Obviously we have uh, uh, resistance to those pieces of legislation from the real estate community. Uh, and we've got to overcome that resistance um, and, and pass that legislation so that you all have a, a fighting chance to uh, continue to stay where you are. Um, and, you know, like Talia, who's been in, in their space for over 40 years, um, uh, and uh, the Chocolate Factory and, and uh, uh, QED and Astoria and everyone else, all of you have probably similar stories. Um, you know, you helped make the neighborhood what it is. 
uh, and uh, in order for it to stay um, uh, great and affordable, there's got to be a chance for you to survive and stay there and also make some money and pay the artists, right? We have to pay artists um, and, and, uh, and you've got to be able to do that. Great. Um, you mentioned that there's resistance, as I'm sure there always is. And what we have right here is a, a large gathering of passionate people. So I guess the, my last little question is, uh, how can the folks on this call help? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think there's a, a number of things that uh, can and should be done. I think that the number of people in government who come from the arts uh, and who care about this issue passionately um, is limited. Uh, I'll be honest with you. And so I think you've heard me say this guy, I encourage uh, artists to run for office and to get involved uh, politically in their communities, uh, get on your community board um, and, and make sure because we're the, uh, you all produce uh, the, the, entertainment uh, and the art and, and the shows that people live for. Um, but then when it comes time to budget and other matters, um, we're the first ones thrown uh, overboard. And, um, and, you know, that's harder to do when you have artists and people who come from the cultural community who are at the table. Um, and, uh, you know, before I got elected, I, I worked for the Queen's library but i was also president of queen's council on the arts and and so i came to this believing in 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 small uh cultural organizations and 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 individual artists um in fact that's how i met sheila lewandowski who's on the call but uh we've got to also elect people like you know harvey epstein and 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 robert carroll and lots of other folks who are um a not beholden to real estate interests um and and we've got to just put pressure on every elected official and every candidate and we've talked about this before at, at lit like what is your platform for culture and the arts and and theater and do you have one have you even thought about this right everyone talks about some of the other issues but but we've got a, a as a movement be a stronger political force and and um and because i can guarantee you as someone who came from libraries and the arts that i use every ounce of my political capital um on that budget negotiating team and in leadership um for culture and the arts and and libraries but you know if i'm not in the room and i'm not saying there aren't lots of other people who care about this issue there are but um but you know if if you're if you're <laughs> If you're not at the table, you're on the menu, right? So um, we've got to uh, just make sure that we're getting more and more people in office who care about the arts, who've actually gone to a show, who actually know what independent theater is, um, and and who who care about artists. Um, so I think that that's one of the reasons why I've always loved uh, lit, um, and and one of the reasons why you know I've I've been to a lot of your events and spoken and and, and wanted to be a part of this um, because I know that there's power and I guess that's the last thing I would say is that even in a moment like this there's great power in this room collectively right there's great power um, uh, to demonstrate to elected officials um, that. Uh, that behind you are tens of thousands, if not millions of people who want and need you to survive. Um, so I, I hope that was uh, somewhat of an answer to your question as I checked to see whether or not I needed. It sounds funny to say on the floor of the city council, although I am uh, <laughs> in, in my house, but I will be uh, called uh, to the floor of the city council soon. Absolutely. I think that's something all of our panelists can really uh, relate to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Guy. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, would you like to move on into something that all the panelists can uh, engage in? 
Sure. Um, if we didn't want to circle back to the other testimonials, also quickly, uh, since the last time you told us, uh, Councilmember Van Bremer, I did join my committee of Brooklyn CV6, uh, where uh, I also uh, have gotten to see uh, Assemblymember Carroll's work as one of the representatives for that area. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to some other lit members that are uh, that are on CBs in this meeting. I know David Pankus and Robin Rothstein are both community board members who are out there, and I'm sure there are others that I'm forgetting. Ah. Uh, there was a lot of applause in the uh, chat. Uh, I wish this was still live theater where you could hear the, uh, the applause. There was some positive feedback around uh, uh, open spaces for uh, for arts to be, um, you know, done in, in the streets uh, while we're waiting for our venues to become fully safe again. Um, but yes, again, thank you for, for your support and all of your time. Uh, Amy, did you want to um, continue with the testimonials or? or uh... I just feel like our panel has been patiently waiting and hasn't really had much of a chance to get in. Uh, so I wanted to give them a chance to, to speak. One thing that the council member uh, just said that really strikes a chord is that if we don't have a seat at the, the table were on the menu. And I'm wondering if anyone has thoughts about uh, the fact that the mayor's task force does not include any small venues and what can we do to get represented on the task force or what else we can do to get, uh, get our voices heard. Uh, is that for me? For anybody. Okay. Yeah. Uh... Uh, look, I think we should, uh, and I'm happy to uh, Jimmy, I could just jump in. There. <laughs> oh. Sorry, Harvey. Uh, no, that, uh, uh, no, I just was going to say that I, I think this is a real issue about how we treat and respect from small cultural institutions and community-based organizations and the fabric of New York. And, and we don't just see it with the mayor's task forces, but we see them with the governors as well, where they're engaging in a reopening plan and the reopening plan is focused on, uh, to be honest, is donors and people who are millionaires and people who run large corporations of real estate development. And that's not the New York uh, I support. New York, I believe in our community-based groups who do social and economic justice work, who are with us on the ground every day, who are on the Zoom, who are working on small theaters, who are keeping communities alive. And when neighborhoods are abandoned, we're fighting for those communities. And those are the people who have real insight and real important say as we move forward. And our mayor and our governor, unfortunately, seem to forget about that. They forget that communities matter and neighborhoods matter and institutions matter. So I think it's our job to continue to let them know, to, to write to them and say, hey, we want to be on these bodies, both to the mayor and the governor. If you need help at the, the council level, I have a lot of faith in Jimmy. He's been an amazing leader. You have the Public Advocates Office and uh, Delcini, a longtime friend in Jamani, will be with you. On the state level, Bobby and I and other people who are progressive allies will push for this. But we need to look at the bigger issue. And the bigger issue is how we help people reopen and what's it look like. And part of this got to be the cancel rent for small businesses. And how do we do that? And how do we do that knowing that it's a taking? It is. You can't just take someone's rent without just compensation then at least we have a conversation about what's just compensation and what's the state's obligation to the theaters across our state to the small venues in my district in the Lower East Side and East Village to ensure they can be vital, continue to be vital fabrics of our community. Let's discuss just compensation and the state's obligation to provide that. That's our message and that's how we do it together. And the things that the city can do and the state can do can be a unifying force. So I think we should push that. We should get just compensation, if not, no evictions. And if not, we just keep going down our bucket list. I think we want our topest priorities. And if we can't get those, let's discuss plan B and plan C. Well, we need plan A to be effectuated together. Yeah, I-, I, I You know, here, here, Harvey, um, I, I agree with everything he said. I think another way um, to make sure um, that small independent theaters survive as well as small businesses um, throughout our state um, is to make sure, uh, and I think he's on the call, Alec Duffy, that theaters that have business interruption insurance and have been paying those premiums for
for years are paid out on their legitimate claims. I have the legislation in the state legislature to do just that. And of course, that dovetails very, very neatly into Harvey's message about canceling rent. Because of course, if we were able to get all of you working capital or the some of you that do have business interruption insurance, that working capital, we can then start talking about, well, maybe doing abatements on property uh, taxes for certain landlords if they give reductions in rent. And then if you had some working capital from business interruption, we would be able to start getting the ball rolling and figuring out what, uh, how we're getting back to a new normal. Um, I think also Harvey hit the nail right on the head um, when he talked about the governor and the mayor having a top-down approach that is so focused on large real estate, large corporations. But I think anybody, and I think independent theater owners know this best, is that without a foundation, all of those things fail. So the reason I, I'm intimately aware of, of independent theaters, not only did I have a play produced uh, by an independent theater, um, I acted for a number of years with a number of different independent theaters um, in the Lower East Side, in Midtown, Uptown. Um, and of course, uh, because of those experiences, I know many people um, who didn't have to become lowly assembly members, but went on um, to very vibrant careers in the arts, um, doing a multitude of things. And they never would have been able to get that springboard um, if it were not for the very talented, diverse, uh, independent theater scene that is New York City. Um, and that goes for our small businesses in a whole host of fields. And that is why New York is such a wonderful place to live in, is because it is a dynamic place. It is a diverse place. It is not um, a museum piece that um, we should allow to atrophy. And unfortunately, um, if we allow for the governor and the mayor's business plans to go forward, it will, of course, save, you know, the large financial institutions and you know, real estate uh, institutions. Um, and it very well, unfortunately, may be at the detriment of all of our small businesses. So I think it's something that behooves all of us um, to say when we're talking about canceling rent, when we're talking about insurance companies that are sitting on a trillion dollars of reserves right now, one trillion dollars of reserves, um, and the American people, of course, bailed them out in 2008, that we need to stand up um, for our, our small businesses. And that includes our small art venues. Why, why fight this war of beating COVID if we're going to allow the things that make our lives worth living and enjoyable um, aren't gonna also be saved? Yeah. Um. Uh, Deputy Public Advocate Glover, I think you were trying to speak a moment ago. Oh, and you're on mute, sorry. Yeah, after uh, Assemblymember Carroll and, and Harvey, uh, I don't know if I need to say a whole lot else. I agree with both of them. This is a time that uh, it's time to do a reset and do things differently moving forward. I love the idea of folks from the arts being involved in, in political issues, etc. I know that uh, what I can say on the city level is that the public advocate is uh, looking into, I don't have language that I can share at this time, but looking into uh, small businesses and things like loan relief and grant programs. Um, I've been sitting here listening to all of the conversation. I, and I, I remember the AIDS crisis up close and personal. And uh, well, not personal, but up close and because I worked in PR and I worked on AZT and shout out, by the way, to Larry Kramer for acting up. Um, and what I remember, yes, I, 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 if you've never if you've never been in his presence, you really missed a wonderful thing. Um, and but I what I remember was the fear was that at least one of my fears was losing the cultural community. <clears throat> and if, if you don't have that, you don't have a society. So I think this, this conversation is very important. It's very, it's very crucial. Uh, I have, I, Jamani is a, is a performer. I am not, but I love theater. I have always loved theater. I, you know, I've been around a long time. I remember going out to the public theater. I think the first thing I ever saw at the public theater was uh, a show, a play call for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow was an, is enough. Uh, and uh, I have friends who are in theater. So this, this is very, this is personal for me also. 
Um, and uh, that's pretty much what I have to say. It's it's like it's time to do a reset, do something different. And uh, the public, the office of the public advocate is here to uh, support you all the way. And of course, we are in full support of the GNR Julian you mean new uh, bills uh, for rent relief. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, in terms of the reset, I was reminded that a couple of days ago was the anniversary of the New Deal being signed into law. You know, it was another moment of a large crisis and needing to take firm action. Uh, so uh, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I think um, I'm just keeping an eye. There's so many people and there's so much great activity uh, and I wish we could address every question and every comment that's coming up. Um, I will say that uh, there's a lot of excitement about the business interruption as a source of being able to provide some capital, um, but not necessarily every organization or every company had access to uh, business interruption insurance beforehand. Um, but uh, do you know what the current status is on, on that proposal? Um, sure, Guy. Uh, you know, we have uh, 35 or 36 co-sponsors in the Assembly or, and 14 or 15 in the Senate. Um, it's an issue that is brought up um, almost every time we have a conference um, by myself and others. Um, I think eventually there are, just like the cancel rent um, issue, that there are large real estate interests pushing back against it to just stifle the conversation entirely. Um, there are very powerful insurance lobbyists uh, in Albany who are talking to both leadership as well as the governor's office. Um, I eventually do think we're going to break their back. Um, and I don't know what it's going to look like, just like I do eventually think the rent issue and property taxes and mortgage forbearance, eventually we're going to have to come to a solution that is people and small business oriented, or the devastation will be so extreme. Uh, and it will be extreme not just because of evictions and loss of businesses and loss of, of, of great income by so many, um, but you know the structures and the way we fund our city won't make sense. And so I, I think just like how New York was the incubator of the New Deal in the late 20s, uh, before FDR was elected to president. Um, I think that New York um, can act as an incubator to some smart ideas to save our tenants, our homeowners, uh, our small businesses. And uh, I'm positive, uh, I, I hope it's my bill. I think my bill is, is a good piece of legislation, but I think there um, eventually is gonna have to be a reckoning on all of these. And that includes insurance companies um, that are sitting on record, record reserves. Um, and uh, have been taking people's money for years and years and years. Uh, and there's a standard clause when an insurance company is taken to court, what did that person who purchased that insurance reasonably assumed was covered? If this isn't business interruption, I don't know what is. The, the average person reasonably assumed this was covered. Um, and uh, we need to get those claims paid. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I wanted to say something. This is Randy from Indie Space. Um, as you know, we represent uh, small indie venues for the most part, venues that operate with 99 seats or less. But we do have other venues on this call that are slightly larger but still considered small and have similar or the same concerns that our venues do. You know, we're not talking about venues with huge lists of trustees that are going to be able to help bail us out at this moment. We don't have endowments um, to lean on in this moment. It really does come down to extending the, this eviction timetable. It comes down to insurance and it comes down to rent cancellation for us or, it's, or that's it. And I mean, it seems like we have interested in understanding representatives here, thank goodness. I do wanna ask Justin from NEVA because uh, NEVA represents nationally uh, venues. And I do think that there are other places that are thinking in the same line that we are, but they may also have some other ideas of ways that they are gonna make it through this moment. Somebody mentioned in the, in the chat in Toronto, uh, it's like 25% owners taking a hit, 25% venues taking a hit, and then the city or the government is, is taking on the other 50% of the rent. I mean, we are all going to hurt a little bit after that. It's understandable. Rent forgiveness has to be partnered with mortgage forgiveness, 
We understand that they likely will have to go hand in hand in order for this to go anywhere. Um, so how does that land in our, at the bank level where we have FDIC insured banks and we have, you know, anyway, I, I'd like to give Justin a chance to talk to us a little bit about other things that he's seeing on a national level. Yeah, um, the one thing that is was most apparent is that as operators of theaters and music venues, we're in a sense also promoters. We have, we are advertising our shows to um, ticket buyers. And with that, we can now use um, that same mechanism as a voice to, to get our, our concerns and share our story. Um, and the thing that really um, made Neva so successful is that just with the 1500 members that we had, which is quite a bit, um, but still, um, compared to the amount of emails and action items that have went directly to the senators, um, I think we've had over 500,000 emails go out. So we're able to com compete on, a, on the level um, of the National Restaurant Association in terms of getting our voices heard. Um, and I think that it's very important that we use that and, and come up with a, a a unified story to to make to make it known that like I mean when it comes to developers I feel like they should be just as afraid as we are I mean nowadays um, looking in the future and the new normal is going to be that people have the opportunity to work not from home but from anywhere what is going to make the cities important what are going to make people want to stay invested in 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 a community um, so if it's not the live experience then what is it? So, and I think that's, that's a story that, that should resonate for those developers who've invested heavily in these cities as well. Like the cost of keeping our industries alive is like not a half a percent would be overkill, like, you know, of, of the, the numbers that we're talking about on the national level. So um, I think that's, that's kind of what we learned is like we getting, getting the voices heard. Is, is really what we can do right now and telling a story that resonates with people who might not actually be so so invested in the arts on the on the you know direct level in terms of going out to shows or whatever but then they can see how it how that that will resonate on on a larger scale with with their businesses um, Justin th thank you so much for that I'm sorry if I, I cut you off a little bit I just wanted to announce that uh, New York State Senator Brad Hoyleman has joined the call as well so we want to say welcome to Hi, the senator you. hello so can, can I just add one thing to what he was talking about of course. Um, and we'll, um, and my senator thank you Brad for all you do for for me as well uh, and you know Bobby's point of business interruption insurance but the cancel rent movement isn't just about canceling rent, saying landlord has to eat it up. It's about just compensation. And the question we have to answer is what that looks like. And so it isn't dollar for dollar. Maybe it is the government eats 50%. They do by in form of tax breaks or revenue directly to the landlord. Maybe the landlord eats 25%. And maybe the small business does come up with 25%. But that's what a cancel rent idea is. Like, how do we look at it comprehensively? Do we do, like a bill I have says, do we give uh, tax breaks to a landlord in the form of real estate tax breaks to, to forgive rent? Do we, do we just make sure there's dollars available? We have bills to, we need to raise revenue on millionaires and billionaires in New York State. We, have a, we had 112 billionaires before, the, before COVID-19. Now we have 118 billionaires. So the richer are getting richer and two million people have filed for unemployment in the same moment. Those folks who are doing well have an obligation to give back. And what do we do with those resources? Can we then help our small arts institutions? Can we help our small nonprofits? Can we help our small businesses with not just loans, but with grant money? PPP on the federal level, some people found it to be helpful, but what are we doing with New York State? We voted for a small uh, loan program yesterday, which I think is important, but well, that's not enough. We need to do more and to, to help the small businesses, especially the small arts venue, because it's true. I mean, I mean, Justin's point is if people want to be in New York, they're going to have to want to be there for a reason. You know, if people with economic means can travel New York, they have to be attracted to New York for something. And arts, 
and theater and you know the parks and the neighborhoods the community that's what it's about and then we need to ensure that we keep those parts of new york alive and well and it requires the state to do something and we, and i hope we do that soon bobby's bill the cancel rent bill the other bills we're talking about we need to do something to protect all these art spaces across our city and our state yeah I just, uh, on the point that's been going around about landlords, I mean, I, I saw that Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce estimates about 45% of businesses aren't paying rent at the moment. Uh, and if spaces go out of business, that, that's money that landlords won't be able to get to support themselves. And we have some, you know, most of our membership are, are renters, but we do also have uh, venues in attendance that own uh, their their uh, spaces. So to me, I think, uh, as you were saying, the goal is to find a way that uh, kind of holds us harmless from, you know, a crisis that we certainly didn't create. Uh, but, you know, I think in the long run, that's something that can also uh, protect the landlords as well from, you know, people just don't have the money to be able to pay them. Uh, but I do also want to welcome um, State Senator uh, Hoyleman uh, is joined us uh, and uh, wanted to pull him into the discussion. And uh, yeah, welcome, welcome, uh, Senator Hoyleman. Thanks for having me, Guy. Just really, uh, I know my colleagues have been filling you in. Zach, my chief of staff, has been on. I appreciate, you know, this conversation so much. It comes at such an important time. I'm up in Albany, as you can see, these are not flags in my bedroom, uh, they're in my office. And um, I'm about to go to a rules committee meeting, so I don't know how long I can stay on, but just to say that we've taken some steps this week um, in Albany, um, they're small steps, I think my colleagues would acknowledge, they're steps in the right direction, they're steps dependent on financial support from uh, Washington, uh, and that I think where wherein the fight lies is getting that federal support first. Um, and if we don't get the federal support, then we need to take the course of action that Bobby and Harvey have suggested, which is we got to come up with our own revenue sources here in the state of New York. We cannot let our small theater venues die. There are a whole range of things that we have to do with uh, the cancel rent movement to protect residents, small businesses, commercial, small landlords. It is a massive problem, but it's going to require resources. So I know that the colleagues who are on this uh, Zoom all agree that we're willing to tap into the largesse that exists throughout the state of New York. It's just having the political will to do it and also waiting, you know, for Washington to act um, and, and pushing uh, our colleagues at the federal level to make certain it does in a relatively timely fashion because um, we don't know how many more bites of the apple we're going to have up in Albany to actually pass bills. Um, but I've been assured by the Senate we're going to be continued to meet. So I, I think that's a very positive step forward. Um, in the meantime, um, let me just make this offer since I have so many uh, independent theater venues in my district as I represent the theater district and a large part of Manhattan. Uh, please reach out to my office if you have issues with your landlord that you think are worthy or necessary or may uh, require some sort of, you know, push from the, from your local elected representatives. That's something that we have gotten pretty good at doing over the last uh, few months is reaching out to landlords, urging them to be um, you know, to come to the table, uh, to negotiate with their, with their uh, um, lessors and, um, and lessees and having, um, having an open mind to like negotiation. Uh, that's what all of us need during this time. So my, my email is bradhoyleman at gmail.com. That's probably the easiest way to, to get to me if you are in my district, uh, the 27th, which as I said, is a big chunk of the heart of Manhattan. Part of it, uh, part of part of it is represented by Harvey too. So uh, he's got some great venues there too. So we can work together um, on on putting some pressure on landlords to be fair and equitable during this very difficult time. Great, thank you. 
Um, I, we absolutely uh, appreciate the support and I think we're all very excited um, to, to be able to help out. I asked this question of uh, council member Van Bramer uh, when he was on earlier, but now I think uh, for um, uh, the panel as a whole, um, where do you see our community being able to help push the ball forward on rent cancellation and on protections for our venues? Uh, Senator Hoeman, if you want to no, start. The question is where, where, where does it go next? How can we help can and we where help? does it go next? Okay, as I, as I said uh, in an earlier call we had, I guess last week, uh, the collective voice of your uh, industry is very important. And I think, it, you know, um, reaching out to your elected officials um, under the rubric of of uh, the League of Independent Theaters is, is a really powerful statement. Um, and so that's number one. Number two is to raise public awareness generally about the plight of small uh, independent theaters. And I think that, you know, obviously involves, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, having press conferences or getting stories, sympathetic stories about the plight of some of your members in local press, uh, television, um, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of, in other words, you have a lot of material, let's put it that way, uh, to work with. And, um, and I, I think that, I think, you know, somebody, somebody like Delcinia from the Public Advocate's Office, you know, knows how to work the press when it comes to tenant issues. And we need to raise the temperature through public awareness. So contacting your elected officials, having public facing events, planting good, you know, stories that, that, that advocate our position about the need for rent cancellation or some form thereof um, is all very important. And then of course the federal strategy, it's not just the local electeds, but your federal, our federal elected officials need to hear from all of us during this crucial time. And the, the members of Congress, they know um, they're working hard, but, um, but, it's good, it's good to back them up with their $3 trillion package that they passed in the House and show them some love for all the efforts they're making uh, in Washington right now. So those would be my suggestions. Um, it really comes down to capturing um, the moment uh, on behalf of your members, given the you know, severe financial strain that they're all under. Yeah, on the subject of sharing the stories, uh, United for uh, Small Business of New York City, which we are a member of the coalition, they're the ones who created this fun graphic I get to stand in front of, uh, they are going to be collecting virtual postcards to send to legislature. So very quick videos talking about your venue, your space, uh, and the pressures you're under. So if you're interested in participating, reach out to the league and, and we'll give you more information. Um, same question to the other members of the panel is how can our membership uh, help drive change? I think one of the assembly members was needing to sign off. I don't know if you, if uh, Harvey Epstein wanted to say anything else. Let me just say one thing I forgot. I forgot to mention Larry Kramer, who I know is, you know, I, I just want, who's a, a neighbor of mine. And I think we should all just acknowledge his role as a public intellectual, playwright, uh, um, supporter of independent theaters and uh, an inspiration for that kind of activism that I think we need to engage in now. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I was, that's what I was about to say. We, we shouted him out earlier, Brad, but I was gonna say, do like Larry Kramer and act up. <laughs> that's what you gotta do. You know, I think, um, you know, I think, look, one of your members um, is the reason the business interruption bill exists in the state legislature. It's Alec Duffy from the Jack Theater Company. is a friend of mine, uh, and he emailed me, and we talked on the phone, and we crafted the initial piece of that legislation, I think, that being proactive and pointed. So there are probably unique circumstances that you're all going through, um, and if you think that there are some unique solutions to those circumstances, um, you know, that's the essence of good democracy. Um, you know, give me a call, give Senator Hoyleman a call, give 
assembly member uh, Epstein a call, give council member Van Bramer a call. You know, that's, that's the point of, uh, of democracy and representative government. And when we have good representation like that, um, it is reactive uh, because not all the ideas are out there yet and not all the solutions are found yet. And it will take the next couple of months uh, and possibly years to come up with all those solutions. And so I think proactively being involved in that is very, very important. And I'd like to encourage you all to have artists at your table. You know, uh, we'll definitely reach out to you, but inviting us as well to the table that we are innovative thinkers. This is where new ideas are born in these small spaces. And we wanna be in conversation with you as much as possible. Um, you know, something else I just want to bring up, um, if it's okay, is the length of time on evictions at this point. And because this moment is lasting longer than I think a lot of us um, hoped it would at the beginning, we're facing, you know, I think uh, we have a couple of bills in that mention extending the evictions uh, six months past or maybe six months from the start of this pandemic. And I'm a little concerned. Uh, we talk a lot about loans. Uh, Assemblymember Epstein mentioned grants. Small businesses, not-for-profit or for-profit, need grants rather than loans. We're already potentially going to be behind on a bunch of things, and um, loans are not the answer at this moment. So it's going to take time, I think, for us to get those grants. It's going to take time for the philanthropic community to move out of the emergency moment and into the recovery moment, um, getting money to our not-for-profit venues at the very least. So I'm hoping that we can amplify grants versus loans, and I'm also hoping we can talk a little bit about extending the period of evictions beyond six months. We know even if we can open our venues, we will not be in a place to be earning serious money. We never, by the way, we're in a place to earn serious money. Let's be real here. But we will not be even be in a place to get ourselves back to normal for at least a year beyond this. If, if, uh, and I think I'm being optimistic. So any thoughts? Yeah, look, so Randy, I, 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 look, I think you're 100% correct. I think that the unfortunate thing, if the state and the city don't proactively look to protect um, both residential and commercial tenants, what we will see is um, a race to the bottom and a tragedy of the commons. There will be tons of landlords who will go out to try to protect what they think, um, you know, their piece of property is. Um, and in doing so, I think that they will, um, you know, decimate um, our commercial corridors, our families. Um, and so we need to protect them from themselves. Um, and you know we we definitely at, at a bare minimum um, go and and extend that moratorium out further. But then we do have to come up with a solution um, that works in the very complicated system of property taxes, mortgages, um, and rent. And I mean, look, and that's the reason why I harp on business interruption insurance. Um, it is a key piece of working capital. So it's a right, you've paid for it if you had that insurance. It will get you money that you don't, that doesn't suddenly magically become a loan that you must pay back now, six months, a year from now, even if it's a no interest loan or a very low interest loan. We need to get folks working capital. Um, we need to make sure um, that we don't end up um, kind of cratering the economy even more by putting in ridiculous, um, impossible standards that folks won't be able to meet and forcing folks to walk away from things, to say, you know what, I'm now gonna proactively walk away. Um, so I, 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 that conversation's gotta continue. I do need to push, because we are currently sitting in the state assembly. Um, people are in chambers debating bills. If there's any other quick questions, I'd love to answer them, um, but I need to jump soon. Uh, I think also um, Senator Hoylman also uh, had to jump. Um, I think we have hit a lot of the um, a lot of the questions that we wanted to present, and we really appreciate your time uh, uh, and the time of all the the folks who who hopped on. 
Um, one thing I will say, there's been a, a robust conversation uh, in the chat and questions about being able to show all of the people who've joined. Uh, Zoom does not have the capacity for 230 people to stream video simultaneously, but if you take a photo of yourself watching this stream, tweet it or post it on Facebook with the hashtag cancel rent, tag your elected officials, get their attention to see that this has been going on and that there's a lot uh, uh, going on here. Uh, and I think that would be great. Um, Katie. Um, I, yes, I just wanted to jump in for Assemblymember Carol, um, as you're talking about, um, uh, what we're talking about is uh, rent, uh, sorry, moratoriums on evictions. And so some courts are starting to open in June, but um, people are not technically being like kicked out until August. So we just wanted to know what kind of protections there are or there could be to keep people in their spaces as long as they are legally allowed to be there uh, with the courts opening up very soon. Well, I, that, look, that's been the topic of conversation in the assembly for the last two weeks is where is that line between the governor's extension of the moratorium till the 20th of August, um, I believe is the date, but will landlords be able to start proceedings in June? I, I, I think what we need is we need clarity from both the governor and the mayor, um, because of course, Self-help is illegal in New York. So, you know, people cannot, landlords can't physically remove you um, from your apartment or from your place of business. You know, I think we need to, um, you know, the sheriff's offices and other things are used to do that. I think we need to say, look, we're not going to allow for that. Um, and we, um, we need to, look, the, I am, Senator Hoyleman has more faith in Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump than I do. Um, I don't think they're coming to the rescue. Um, I don't think they're going to do a single scintilla for New York. And I think that is because it's in their political interest not to. Um, and that's why they won't do it. Um, and th those are just the, the hard, I think, the hard truths. Um, and I sure as hell hope uh, we take the presidency in the U.S. Senate and the cavalry comes in January or February of next year. But I think that's the earliest. Um, and so I think we need all of you um, to be a lot louder um, to the state legislature, uh, to the governor, to the mayor, um, that it's, it's a little bit of a bump uh, to say, let's keep waiting on July 1st, Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump are magically gonna do the right thing for the first time in four years. It's not gonna happen. Um, we, um, I harp on business interruption insurance because it is billions of dollars of direct revenue to small businesses and small theaters. And I know it's not everybody. Um, I harp on it because it's also a highly regulated industry that's regulated by the state of New York um, the state of New York has found parts of contracts unconscionable before. This is um, a thing to really inject much needed funds um, to our small businesses and theaters. Uh, I ask you to urge your assembly member and senators to sign on to the bill um, because it won't save everyone, um, but it'll save a bunch of folks and it'll get folks money for a whole host of things. Um, and that's just got to be the beginning. The other thing is the state of New York needs to borrow wildly. We have the ability to borrow $11 billion right now. The governor's not doing it. Um, and he's not doing it because he says it's fiscally imprudent to borrow for operating expenses. He says, oh, I'm waiting for Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump to, you know, you got to play poker. And if they think we already borrowed the money, they won't give it again. I, you know, you want to wait to July 1, sure. But if we're not borrowing that money on July 1, it's crazy. Um, and, you know, and then we're going to have to raise taxes. Yes, as Harvey said, on the wealthiest. And we're going to have to bring landlords of all sizes to the table. And that might mean that, yeah, the state's going to have to take property taxes. I mean, we're going to have to have really big, bold things that we never would have otherwise done. Um, and I think you've got to ask, your, your assembly member, your state center, and the governor um, to really be courageous um, in this fight. And look, I hope that then, you know, the federal government does save us, but I don't think that's coming until February at the earliest. Um, and I, that would be phenomenal. Um, but th there's a lot of time. 
uh, and a lot of first of the months and from now until then. Absolutely, yes. Um, thank you for, for that. I think we are definitely excited to get out there and make some noise and, and make sure that that message gets heard because I agree, I don't think that there's time to, to wait for you know, too long for, for saviors on high. Uh, but we appreciate your time and, and thank you. Um, I, the, the discussion about eviction and, and you know, landlords, uh, I had a question for a deputy public advocate, uh, Glover. Um, you know, there's not a lot of protections in place and some landlords are not necessarily respecting the rules that there are. So for members who are experiencing some trouble with their landlords, you mentioned a couple resources at the top of the call, but where should people be turning to um, for, for help with uh, if they're getting warnings of eviction or, or things like that uh, uh, sent their way? You're on mute. Sorry. She's coming. <laughs> so sorry about that. No worries. Uh, depending on what it is, but you can have them reach out to our office uh, at, the, uh, 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 at the Public Advocates Office, and there is a link on the website called Get Help. Great. Very, very easy to do. Find the link, Get Help, and, uh, and hopefully uh, folks will be able to, to uh, access that. Yes. I also wanted to let folks know that Indie Space and Indie Theater Fund are working uh, with Paul Weiss Rifkind Law Firm. Um, they've taken us on as a pro bono client so that we can help you all navigate some of those challenges together with our elected officials. So feel free to reach out to Indie Space if you need support. I have a quick question. Um, I, a few days ago, I read that, that um, the mayor signed some sort of law that uh, landlords can't come after commercial property owners personally now for like the good guy clause, I assume. Um, how, how does that work? And, um, you know, I feel like in the meantime, while we don't, we don't know what's going on in terms of um, any kind of relief, specific relief from the government, if, if what are the ways that we can sort of push the laws in a direction where the negotiations just become more more evenly balanced between tenant and um, landlord versus one 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 sided and nego negotiations with the landlord it's kind of holding all the cards. Uh, Public advocate Glover, do you know more information about that um, about that uh, new legislation about? Uh, commercial leaseholders not being personally liable. Um, so you're on, on mute again. Yes, but I don't have the language in front of me. Um, I don't have the exact language in front of me. Someone also said in the chat, I believe that the, the suspension is only through September. So, well, this is definitely a win. It's a short win. Great. So um, it seems like a lot of our elected officials have been pulled into various uh, legislative sessions, which I hope means that they're all passing everything we asked for uh, right now. Um, Amy? Uh, yes, Guy. It, it it feels like this is a transition moment. So mm -hmm. I would love to pull back in the people that have been waiting to give testimonials. And again, I thank them for their patience. I know we mm -hmm. had to shuffle the order to account for some scheduling today, uh, but we'll go ahead and do that and then move into a Q&A session. Uh, so Erez, I'm going to pull you in if you're ready. We'd love to hear from you. He's coming. Erez Ziv from Frigid, New York. Erez? How you doing, everybody? So I've been running two venues in the East Village since uh, June of 97. So this is our 23rd anniversary coming up now. Um, for us, you know, it's, it's been wonderful. We usually host a thousand shows uh, in an average season. We have tens of thousands of audience members uh, every season, and we can barely uh, 
pay our bills and pay the artists and pay the rent with that. Now we've been closed for two and a half months. We don't know when we're going to open. When we open, it's going to be to maybe 20 or 30% capacity uh, by law for a while. Uh, it's impossible. All, all the, everything we've agreed to pay is not, it's just not going to work. The, the rents, it's impossible. It's just not going to be possible. Uh, and something's got to be done or else there's going to be a lot of us that just won't, won't make it through this. Um, we're not looking, we're, we're looking at not having a normal audience in until sometime uh, in 2021, maybe, hopefully. Uh, so it's just not, not a way that we can survive. In the meantime, we're trying to figure out what to do online. We've torn out the seats to try to figure out how we're going to do social distance seating, which is going to be very interesting and a lot of fun to play with. And you know, the artists are going to enjoy it. Um, but it's, there's no way that we can pay our rents on 30% capacity. That's just mathematically impossible for, for any of us. Uh, and our business is based on bringing people together into a small room, uh, into a crowded small room. And that's over for the foreseeable future. That's over. Uh, and we're going to need some support from on high uh, to make sure that it's not over. Thank you, Erez. I, I just also want to amplify the scope of the work that Frigid New York does with their Frigid Festival and how they've provided a home for hundreds of theater companies in their space. So thank you so much for that, Erez. And Erez, just, you know, you're far from alone. Um, Neva did a study with, with our members and 90% wouldn't be able to survive um, even with whatever the, the not paying rent for, for more than five months at this point. Yeah. I mean, so. yeah. Rent is, is part of the bills. 20% capacity means rent and some other bills can't be paid. Great. Yeah. Uh, Christina Perry from the chain is also here uh, again, Christina, thank you so much for all of your patience pulling you in now so that you can speak. Christina, there she is. Hi, kicked me off for a brief moment there. Oh no, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, I am too. Um, hi, I'm Christina Perry. I'm the Director of Development of the Chain Theater, as Amy was mentioning. Um, our company is entering our 10th season this year. We've been around 10 years. Um, I was invited by Randy and Amy to talk a bit about our company's history and some of the real estate journey that we've been on. Um, our company first opened its first space in Long Island City. Uh, councilman Jimmy Van Bramer was our councilman, so it was wonderful to see him today. Um, and his office was just wonderful as we were in Long Island City during that time. We opened during Hurricane Sandy. We finished building at our space when contractors walked off the job. We opened our festival there during one of the worst nor'easters in New York City. And then a few years later, um, our landlord sold the building, broke our lease, and the building was demolished for luxury condos. It took us two years to find our current space and that space would not have been found without Randy Berry and the League of Independent Theaters. Um, and so we're very grateful to Randy and us for that, thank you. And during those two years, we learned a lot about New York real estate and what it means to be a not-for-profit independent theater. Um, one of the big things we learned is that as a not-for-profit independent theater, there are currently no incentives for landlords to have you in their building. We thought that would be a plus for them, and it turns out um, it doesn't matter that much, and they didn't, uh, it wasn't that much of an incentive to have us in there with them. So that was a big thing. Also, to find a landlord that wants to have theaters as their tenants. Most landlords don't, um, and there's many reasons, but as you all know, and the, everyone I'm speaking to, you know how theater provides positive foot traffic for every block that they occupy, how they bring people in. People aren't just, when they go to the theater, they're not just going to the theater. They are bringing in money to that neighborhood that they are currently walking in. Um, and that's something that we've learned as well. We are currently part of Community Board 4 in Manhattan. So David Pincus, I saw you on there. It's wonderful to see you today and we miss you. 
Um, and I, I really do encourage everybody to get onto your community boards. It's really important. You meet wonderful people there. We had such a great experience this past fall in making some presentations with ours. Um, and that has been very exciting for us. Um, we are holding on and holding hope. We have two spaces, a 65-seat uh, theater and our most recent space, a 40-seat theater that we just <laughs> expanded into and renovated this past summer. Things are going really well for us. We are one of um, the few affordable spaces in Midtown Manhattan, and so we wanted to expand that even further. Um, <laughs> and so, and now we are here. So as you will see, and I know, I think Amy mentioned this in one of our previous phone calls too, theaters also improve the spaces that they're in, bringing up the real estate values. We're always looking to improve. Um, so landlords that may be hesitant at having theaters know that we're always taking great care of our space because we want to show that off to our patrons. And I, I thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for this platform and this time to speak. Um, it was wonderful to have Senator Hoylman on too. I know we've written him letters. And in a recent town hall with Senator Giannaris, who I know isn't on here today, he said something that really stuck with me and I think is just kind of at the core of all of this, which is if the government has the power to shut down your business and close your doors, they also have the power to provide some sort of relief. And so I really hope that we can have that. And thank you if anyone wants to take a tour of our space, chaintheater.org, and you can take a look at our spaces. So yeah. thank you so much, Christina. I can attest that they have done beautiful work in renovating that space. And in fact, I think that the set that is currently on stage oh. is a play that I directed yeah. that opened and closed on the same day, and it's a beautiful set. So. <laughs> yes, but Christina, thank you so much. You've had such an interesting real estate journey that really encapsulates some of the the challenges that we're facing and i'm going to now pull in our final uh speaker who is going to give a testimonial uh angel should be joining us in just a moment and i just wanted to remind everybody we are recording this so we will share these testimonials with the elected officials that were on the call Absolutely. So that they're sure to hear your voices, um, you know, going, going for it. Okay. Angel, are you here? Yes, I am. Ah, there you are. Hello. It's so good to see you. Okay. Hi. Hi. My name is Angel Gilorios. I'm uh, the Artistic Executive Director of the Thalia Hispanic Theater in Queens. We're in Sunnyside in the 26th District of uh, uh, Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer, and together with other um, seven Hispanic groups, uh, eight actually, we have we are part of the Alliance of Teatros Latinos New York. There are seven more in Manhattan and one more in the Bronx. Uh, we produce world premieres and American premieres of the best writers and composers of Spain, Latin America, and the Hispanics in the year, U.S. And in 43 years, uh, our more than 230 productions have received uh, so far 225 awards for artistic excellence, not only locally, but also nationally and internationally, because we take many of our unique productions to international festivals. Um, we were uh, at Thalia really, um, you know, deep impact in a deep impact for this, uh, from this coronavirus, because 80% of our staff, of, um, including me, an artist got the virus and actually we lost our great chairman of the board of directors, uh, Francisco Fuertes. And um, some of the artists of the, our latest production that uh, we had to close the following day of our world premiere on March uh, uh, 14th. Um, my main concern at this time, it's uh, of, of crisis, after having experienced another two crises, looks like the theater is always in crisis, Meaning the 2001, the 9/11, and and you know in 2008 after the economical crisis and all that is that every time I hear about billions and trillions of deficits for the state and city, then of course the budget allocated for culture becomes always the most problematic one, and especially for us, for the small or, uh, theater organizations, it's we are at the last uh, of the ladder. Uh, so always. Uh, we are the most uh, hurt, and um, in our case, in this last since the last crisis, uh, 
from the state and the NISCA special art services, for example, we were cut 50%. And um, I, I, my main concern now, because next month it's going to be uh, approved the budget for culture for the city of New York, is that what can affect us for the whole next season starting right in July. And it's because it's always been a problem to have these initiatives, as they call it right now, that they are here now, but they can be gone tomorrow. And four of them are absolutely the bread and butter for many of all of us, I guess, is the Coalition of Theaters of Color Initiative, the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, and the Casa and Su Casa. So those four, I mean, uh, precisely because they are initiatives and therefore no are, but are not budget items, are usually the ones that unless our council members, uh, you know, really fight for them and please do that. I know our council member, Jimmy Van Bremer, really push very hard for it. So I think it's very important that those can stay in place and, and are not the ones, the first ones cut, as usually happens. And in terms of the state, as we've been having these great assembly members and senators, please uh, fight more for, for the, you know, the NISCA budgets. I don't know what's going on because, you know, for us, for example, especially our services, it's, it's one of those things that had to do with theaters of color and a small uh, organizations of, of that, of 99 seats. And uh, I don't know why, every time there is something, we are the first ones caught. They could start uh, cutting CIGs, you know, better and instead uh, the ones for us because yeah they have huge budgets and yes of course it's important for them to have a cut but for them is a little cut like a cut in here for us could be a cut of the head completely so um that's my main concern thank, thank you angel i think what you're asking for is, is equity which yes. is very fair <laughs> right uh fantastic thank you so much i really appreciate all of the people who gave testimonials, all of the people who joined our panel. I know that a lot of our, the representatives did have to leave and people have raised their hands and have questions. I think we did try to get to a lot of them, but Katie, if there are any questions that uh, the deputy a public advocate or Randy or Justin or even just the members of LIT can help answer, uh, I would love to hear from from anyone in attendance? Uh, yes, um, I'm kind of working through the questions right now uh, because Yes, most of our panelists are not here, and so therefore um, we will, uh, as the League of Independent Theater, we will continue to be following up on all of the brilliant ideas that were shared. And then um, we also encourage you to follow up with all of the wonderful ideas. Uh, we will continue to put out um, our contact information throughout uh, the next little while at the end of this webinar. Um, but you can always find us at litny.org, so it's L-I-T-N-Y.org, I'll put that in the chat. Um, I guess, uh, so kind of for, for Justin, um, is there anything, so technically you represent music venues, but obviously you're here and we know that there's so much synergy between us and you. Um, what can we do to help you? What kind of coalition are you looking to build and how can, how can we help you and then in return make sure all of our voices are, um, are elevated into um, to making real lasting change not only for New York City but for the country? Yes, on the on the national level right now, um, what we've what we what I've learned and what what Neva's learned um, is that instead of trying to sort of propose any sort of new legislation, that it's really um, important to try to steer the current bills that are out there already in the direction that would be beneficial to all of us. Um, and the way that we're primarily doing it um, is by having people contact their representatives. Um, and there is a website that we have set up, um, saveourstages.com. And you, if you log on there, it's pretty easy. Kind of like fills out the, the letter for you and you just have to hit submit. Uh, so that's really on a, on a level. And in, in what we're fighting for is it's, it's all the same. <laughs> I mean, when I, you know, when I spoke with Randy a couple weeks ago, it's there, we're, venue, Venue operators, uh, independent music venues, and comedy clubs, and theaters, when I hear you all speak and see your faces light up about the productions that you're doing and the inspiration behind why you're doing it. My background is as a classical musician, and I had the crazy idea of putting classical music in a club. 
club. And, you know, that was what sort of driven has been driving me to want to be doing live music. So um, it's not, it, it's an industry that has tremendous staying power, actually, even though it's very hard to pay the bills, you know, we, we figure a way to make the shows go on. And unlike a lot of other hospitality industries, which are maybe last a year or two, and then they're kind of gone, like, even though the profits aren't big, we make it work. And we don't, we rarely kind of ask for these types of handouts. So um, I think that's just what, what we have to share with the world is like, we're, we're sort of coming together, at least for the independent venues, really for the first time, we were always kind of doing our own thing. Um, but I, I think on a national level, that's what it is. And we're trying to, to organize the venues now on, on the um, New York level and, and just have, a, have that voice and be that squeaky wheel. Katie. Katie. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yes, I was just saying, Justin, thank you so much. Um, you have been such a, a force of, of, of just inspiration and clarity in this conversation. So thank you so much for your, your vision um, and for sharing that uh, so beautifully. So thank you. Um, and we look forward to being in touch with you uh, on lots of other things. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, so I also wanted to just turn it over to Guy for a moment. Guy uh, and the League of Independent Theater have been creating um, an explainer of bills that we have put in the chat. We will continue to send out. We'll continue to post. But we just kind of want to take one big step backwards for everyone who's still here um, for you to just kind of understand what specifically we're talking about and in order to then know what you are actually advocating for. Um, and as Justin said, seeing how we can fit ourselves into these bills and into this legislation. So I'm going to turn it over to Guy, um, and he's going to talk a little bit more about specifically what's happening at the state level and the bills that are out there. Great. Uh, thank you, Katie. Um, so as Ed, a lot of this is in the bill explainer that uh, Chris uh, just reposted in the chat, but I know everyone is uh, participating up a storm, so we'll make sure it goes out in the email and you can find it on the League's Facebook page uh, as well. Um, basically, there's a number of different proposals. There's lots of things that are going on right now, um, primarily around canceling rent. Um, the proposal would be to forgive rent for um, most of the bills. It's both commercial and uh, uh, residential housing. Uh, and the bills also currently include um, various forms of, of mortgage uh, related relief for the landlords as well. Um, because I think, as was mentioned, it's likely that it's going to need to take both. Um, there's two versions of the bill. Um, one is a rent forgiveness for 90 days. Uh, another one is rent forgiveness for the duration of the crisis uh, and would also apply to future uh, public emergencies uh, if the government is shut down. Um, again, you can look in the, uh, in the explainer because saying a bunch of bill numbers and sponsors is just gonna, is just gonna become uh, uh, very clouded. There's also a bill in the state legislature uh, to extend eviction suspension. So as we mentioned, right now there's a moratorium on evictions. It ends uh, on June 10th uh, for some and August, uh, in August for folks who are directly impacted by COVID. So there's legislation that would extend that until this crisis uh, is, is over. Um, there's also the business interruption uh, coverage uh, that was discussed by um, Assembly Member Carroll uh, that would say that if you had insurance and that insurance covered business interruption, then you would be able to get paid out on uh, the lost revenue uh, for, the, for the time of this crisis. Uh, if your insurer is currently telling you that it's not covered. What I've heard from a number of elected officials in the past is that you should try and claim it from your insurance today, regardless of what the insurance says, regardless of it, if it includes business insurance, because you know maybe there's another part of your insurance that might cover it. Maybe when this passes, the fact that you've already put a claim in might accelerate being able to get at that. Regardless, make sure your insurance company hears from you uh, and, and definitely see, see what you can get. Um, there's a few other uh, um, sort of more stopgap uh, fixes that have been proposed. Um, and then we also mentioned that in New York City Council, there's two things that have actually passed. So these are actually law now.
One is uh, a prohibition on enforcing personal liability in commercial leases. Now, I would say reach out to someone who is a lawyer and get deeper into it to know exactly what that covers. But basically, if you have a commercial lease and that lease says that you personally are going to cover uh, it if your company can't cover it, that that uh, that um, may be prevented from being enforced uh, for, um, I think, until September. But again, that's something where you want the detail of going over that with an attorney. Just know that that's, that's something that's out there. And then the other thing that was just passed, so again, this is law currently, is that uh, if uh, a landlord is, is harassing you, threatening based on the fact that there's a government shutdown to evict you or to you know, otherwise harass you, uh, you, there's actually these civil penalties you can go at between ten and fifty thousand dollars. Again, to know exactly what is harassing under that law, or you know exactly whether you're someone who'd be protected by it, you'll want to talk to someone who's an attorney who can you know, go there, uh, either by reaching out to uh, IndieSpace to find out more, or by reaching out to the deputy uh, public advocate. Uh, but just know that those are out there. Again, all the details are in this document, including you can actually go and see which uh, elected officials are currently sponsoring those. If they are a sponsor or a co-sponsor, that means that they're in favor of it. If you don't see your elected official there, that means there's an opportunity for you to call them, get them to co-sponsor it, because bills only pass once there's a certain amount of co-sponsors. That means it's going to pass when it goes to a vote. I think that's a succinct uh, uh, version there. Uh, were there any other questions that came up while I was yammering? I do have a poll that I can launch just to get a quick uh, snapshot of what the attendees are uh, thinking about some of the things that came up today. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll and allow people to uh, vote, participate in the poll, but then of course we can still answer questions from the people that have their hands raised or anything that came up in the chat. Yes, while everyone's filling out the poll, I want to also thank you all so much for your questions and for your engagement in this conversation. Um, it was uh, Robin Rothstein, who uh, I think jumped off the call already, but she said that this is just such a watershed moment. It's so incredible to see so many, over 200 people here, engaged, curious, worried, active, um, and we are so excited uh, to be all here together in this space. We are so happy that Lit has been around since 2008, 2009. Um, we are happy to be this space and have this space um, for uh, for us as a community to come together. There are so many more spaces, uh, uh, just so many more opportunities, so many more coalitions we can continue to build as we uh, march through this very, very important uh, we march through this very, very important time. Uh, so uh, overall, the question and the question portion is going to be wrapped up at this point. Um, I was responding to as many as I could. Everything will be saved. We'll be reaching out individually. We'll be reaching out in more of a big group way. Um, we will continue to follow up with uh, all of our uh, representatives and uh, government officials who are here today. Um, but thank you all so, so much for your participation. And, um, and I'm going to turn it back to Amy to talk about the poll and um, kind of close us all out with uh, herself and all of our uh, additional panelists. So thank you all so much. Ah, thank you, Katie, for sending it back. Uh, we do have, uh, I'm just clocking uh, people who are participating in the poll. I want to give it a few more minutes, uh, but I do also want to say, uh, give my thanks to everyone who participated everyone who pulled together to help make this event uh, a success. This was something that uh, was spawned sort of out of the moment. And in less than two weeks, we were able to pull together a town hall that uh, at one point, you know, we did have close to, to 400 people at one point here. So that just shows the size and scope of the issues we're facing. I, I wanna give another big thank you to our panelists who came and those who are uh, here and those who have also had to step off. We will be 
posting this uh, at a later to be determined date because we are recording, but we don't know exactly whether we'll post it on YouTube uh, or just on our website. That is something that we want to, to look at and figure out as we go forward, but it will be made public so that people can review and go back over the information presented. I also want to encourage people to go to LIT's website, L-I-T-N-Y dot O-R-G. We've got uh, the explainer there, that bill, or that explainer of the bills that Guy and Chris posted in the chat, it's there. We also have some quick start guides for advocacy. So there's templates and sort of how to's for how to contact your representatives. Uh, there's also a list of, of resources for those uh, that are affected by COVID. So uh, this has been a really impactful conversation. I know a lot of information was sort of going back and forth and I feel like there, this is such a broad conversation that can be had that the conversation will continue. Uh, we will do everything we can to keep pushing this fight forward and we can do it with your help. Uh, if you have not already joined as a member of the League of Independent Theater, I encourage you to join. It is absolutely free, but you'll get emails with things like action items and voter registration drives and our endorsements of candidates that are arts friendly. So thank you very much. This has been a wonderful way to spend the afternoon and uh, we have such strong paths forward now.